with uh, Professor Paul Walker. Uh, Professor Paul Walker well, does not need an introduction. Uh, he uh, has been a director of the American Research Center in Cairo for over 10 years. He is currently deputy director for academic programs, Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. And Professor Walker has published dozens of papers and dozens of uh, books amongst the latest ones, orations of the Fatimid Caliphs, festival sermons of the Ismaili Imams, and Caliph of Cairo, Al-Hakim bi Amrillah. Um, his current research focuses on popular ritual governing institutions and Ismaili doctrine in the Fatimid period. Professor Walker will be presenting on Al-Ghazali as a key historical witness to the Ismaili doctrine of the Alim. Thank you, Professor Walker. So let me begin by saying that when I accepted the invitation to this conference, I was thinking of a wonderful trip to London and a great English breakfast and meeting all of you, the ones I don't know, and seeing again the ones I do know. Um, instead, I'm at home at, up at an ungodly hour and trying to maintain an internet connection, which is unreliable. But in any case, let me launch into my, my topic today, which is the clash between the great Ghazali and the Ismailis. It was an epic moment in the history of Islamic thought, and the consequences are um, many, and they need to be sorted out. But I would say, to begin, that what happens with this two-sided um, problem is that the specialists who know Ghazali really well, and there are a lot of them and they are very good, the Ismaili's clarity, Ismaili history and, and development, I would say. From the Ismaili side, that is the specialists in Ismaili studies who have a substantial background, generally take notice of Ghazali's critique and his um, involvement in this clash but often imprecisely, and the history of this um, momentous event is not as well understood as it should be. Now, this is a two-sided problem, and the question often as I talk about this is, do I begin on the Ghazali side or the Ismaili side? Well, there's a natural place to begin, and that's with the masterful um, wazir to the Seljuks, uh, Nizam al-Mulk, and his Siyasat Name. He was uncommonly well informed about the Ismailis in his domain, but he was also the major patron of Ghazali and the one who appointed him to the Nizamiya in Baghdad. But there is a, a paragraph in the Siya Satname where he is discussing uh, the names for Ismailis in his particular time. That is, in various cities, they are known by different names. For example, Janebi. Mubaraki, uh, Ismaili. And then he ends the paragraph almost casually and he says, and they call themselves Talimis. They call themselves Talimis. Now, of course, we understand the Talim doctrine generally is the insistence on the absolute necessity of the infallible Imam's teaching in order to understand the ultimate principles of faith and so on. What's striking here, and the doctrine itself is not new at all, and I can find a, a passage in Kirmani that fits. For example, Kari Noman uses it. It's the essence in, in effect of Shi Islam. What's striking here is the term itself and the use of the term, Talimi. So something's happened. Um, it did, did not exist earlier. It does not appear in the West, in Egypt, and in Tayyabi um, writings. So it's particular and peculiar to the Dawah in the East, in Iraq and Iran. And of course, we immediately think of Hassani Sabah. And, and in fact, obviously, it is connected with, uh, with Hassan and his career and work. But now, um, in what I'm going to present, Ghazali is a key witness to this and uh, teaches us a great deal about it and its advent. But of course, Ghazali is fairly early, uh, as I will stress, and a much later 
and perhaps even better witness is Shahrastani, of course. Uh, regardless of whether you ultimately decide that Shahrastani was secretly an Ismaili agent, he certainly had and he was privy to inside information. He knew things about Hassan and uh, what was going on at Alamut and so on that are critical. Now, what he says in this regard is that before Hassan instituted the Talim approach, the new way of making the Dawah, the appeal, before he did that, that before he started the Dawah Jadida, he traveled to Egypt and he met there the Imam, Al Mustansir, and they discussed this. And Al Mustansir told him how to go about creating this new form of Dawah that would be suitable for his generation and his time and place. Shafristani is the one who says, the responsibility for the instigation of the Talim doctrine and approach, the argument, is the Imam al Mustansir. Um, I don't see how we can ignore Shafristani and that testimony. But in any case, that would um, be from the Ismaili side. Let me turn now to Ghazali. So where he comes in is in February of 1094, uh, the Abbasid Caliph al Muqtadi dies, and he's succeeded by his 16 year old son who takes the royal title um, al Mustaz here. In, uh, that's 1094. So, one of the th things that he does, we don't know precisely the date, but he decides apparently. Um, aware of the growing threat of the Ismailis in his domain in the East, he asks the leading academic in um, Baghdad, who is Ghazali, to compose a um, expose, refutation, and denunciation of these Ismailis. Ghazali in 1094 is intently working on his famous uh, critique of the philosophers, the Tahafid al philosopher. Um, he obviously probably had little time. He may have been thinking uh, out the, the shape of a work on the Ismailis, but he was um, for that year into the, uh, the philosophers. He published the Tahafid on the 21st of January. 1095. So uh, internal evidence in, in what Ghazali says in other places makes it clear that he finished the philosophers before he took up the Ismailis. So that would put his first uh, major work, and it is a major work, on, in, in refutation of the Ismailis sometime in the spring, early summer of 1095. And that fits a number of things. Um, but it also, remember that 1095 is the year when Ghazali has his great crisis. Uh, first, he can't speak, he recovers. And then finally, at the end of the year in November, he decides he has to actually give up uh, working for the government and leave Baghdad altogether. And he begins a new life. Well, so here is the juncture at which he produces this book. Um, and he called it the infamies of the uh, botany, uh, the Ismailis, um, the Fada'il al botany. It's a very interesting work if you read the whole thing. It uh, belongs in several genres. It starts off, um, it, obviously, as a polemic against the Ismailis, very clearly. I mean, it's, it it's, um, castigates them right from the first page. And it does one or two of the typical things of this kind of anti-Ismaili polemic, which by, by then was very old, at least 200 years of, of writing. And um, al Mustansir's great-grandfather had commissioned al-Bakalani, the great al-Bakalani, to write just exactly the same sort of thing, a denunciation of the Ismailis. Well, one of the techniques is to associate the Ismailis with some obviously heretical 
sect, like the Mazdakiya or the Babakiya or something like that. Because Ali is guilty of that as well. It, it's um, kind of that silly, um, transparent, um, polemical strategy. He's also a bit guilty of another technique, which is to distort the doctrine of your enemy in such a way that it looks absurd and obviously heretical. So in a chapter on the older doctrine of the Ismailis, uh, chapter four of that book, he will, for example, comment that they believe in the intellect, the sabbath, and the soul, the tali, and therefore they believe in two eternal gods. Um, that had been done a hundred years earlier. Um, so it, it's, again, it's kind of transparent and you can see it and it, it strikes uh, one as beneath Ghazali that he would distort something like that and do it that way. Well, uh, there are other examples in this same chapter, chapter four, which is his critique of the older doctrine of the Ismailis. That is, and he's very clear that this is old and there is a new approach, a new doctrine. Um, several times in that chapter, he says, we could go into this further, but we, what we really need to do is to turn to what is um, characteristic of them now, today, indicating that that old doctrine is not the same um, and, and wouldn't be advocated in his time and place. Um, incidentally, one interesting little detail that people miss is that in his mentioning of the Ismaili he says, and they believe in a series of intellects, one for each of the seers. Now, as far as we know, among the Ismailis, that is only advocated by Kirmani. But this would mean, and it's very brief and very frustrating that you only have one line to work with, but it would indicate that he, the Ghazali, had some knowledge of something that came from uh, Kirmani as well as Sijistani and perhaps some of the rest. So that raises the really interesting question of what did Ghazali actually know about the Ismailis and their doctrines? And how did he come to know it? Now, what he says in one place is that when I was about to start on this project of writing this book, um, I gathered, I began to gather their writings and their books which would indicate that he had some actual texts. I can't uh, find any evidence to confirm that he had any actual texts, but it, he says he, he did. So we have to accept that as a possibility. He offers the second one, which I believe is the, is the more accurate. He, he's, somebody says to him, how do you know what these people believe and advocate when they are sworn to secrecy they, they swear each other to secrecy and they will deny that they even advocate whatever doctrine you accuse them of believing in. Well, Khazadi um, says, obviously he knows that's, that's true. He says, but I have met a number of people who early in their lives uh, joined the Ismailis, joined the Dawa and studied with these people and therefore learned their doctrines, but then later thought better of it and um, became renegade members of the Dawah. And they therefore were able to tell me basically what they had advocated, these people. So I think that's probably where most of Ghazali's knowledge comes from, that kind of um, interaction with somebody who was a former um, member of the Ismaili Dawah. Uh, there's the third possibility, and that, that's um, connected to three of the titles that he wrote. Um, he tells us he wrote these three different works. Each one, we only have one part of one now, the other two have disappeared, but they are the result of interaction that he had with Ismailis, first in Baghdad, then in Hamadan, and then in Tus. 
So there is some interaction that actually is taking place. My argument would be that that is contemporary. And so that will involve what we are now going to discuss as the Ta'alim doctrine or argument. So Ghazali moves from a chapter on the older doctrine into what is now being discussed, he says, everywhere. And this is what they are talking about now. That is the Ta'alim, the Ta'alim argument. You can see how much he is concerned by comparing the size of the chapters. The older doctrine occupies in the Arabic text of Badawi, 18 pages. The Talim argument or doctrine takes up almost 60 pages. It's that much more important. It's the contemporary, this is what is happening in 1095. This is what the Ismailis are advocating. And in fact, restricting themselves to, if we can trust Shatarastani, because Shatarastani says, that one of Hassan's um, rules was that the older books should not be read without uh, explicit special permission. So ordinary Ismailis couldn't know the older doctrine. They were restricted strictly to this Talim argument. Um, so Ghazali sets out to describe it. And I think there's no reason to believe that he was uh, um, trying to cheat and make it um, incoherent, it seems to be fairly coherent. He offers it in a number of different ways, one of which is he, he sets it out in eight different propositions. And the argument is that um, the use of reason will not yield certainty and clarity, and that the only following the teaching or instruction of an infallible teacher or instructor. Uh, in other words, the Imam. And he says explicitly, what we are trying to establish on their behalf is that the person in Egypt who presumes to be the Imam is the infallible teacher that all human beings should follow and uh, adopt as, as leader and obey. Um, he puts it that way. By the way, the text does not mention al Musansir. Goldzir, the first person to uh, bring this to into scholarship, apparently misread a word, which in Arabic is al Mubtabsir, not Mustansir. You, you see the difference. It's so close in, in Arabic script, but it is, it is al Mubtabsir. Uh, and I've confirmed that with manuscripts and other things. Okay, so in this argument, he, which he puts forth, and by the way, at the end of it, he says, um, I have just presented this in a way that is the best that can possibly, the case is made by me here in the best possible manner that it could be. And he says sarcastically, um, most of those Ismailis probably couldn't do it as well as I've done it. Um, I, I, I tend to think that he uh, can be trusted in his reconstruction of this argument. Well, there's some issues will come up, but I wanted to note the one, I'm, I'm interested in the chronology of this particularly. And one of the propositions in his construction of it runs as follows. That infallible person whose presence in the world cannot be doubted must either be permitted to hide himself, to not appear openly, nor to summon the people to what is true, or it is necessary that he declare himself publicly, and it is thus wrong that he be allowed to hide, because that would be the concealment of the truth. So the uh, Imam and al cultation of the Twelvers would not be an imam properly, uh, according to this argument. That seems to mean, and he, his argument is sort of based on, there is an actual person claiming the imamate in Egypt. Um, and he, he says that that person in Egypt couldn't be infallible. He, he wears silk and all that kind of thing. So it's very specific that there is a living person 
um, who is accessible and even also says, you know, the claims made on his behalf work better when you're far, far away than if you're up close because you can see all the faults and the reasons. I, I take that to be if you're in Alamut, then he looks a lot better than if you were in Cairo and you could see him occasionally in the streets, so to speak. Okay. Well, so that's Ghazali's critique. Um, and now briefly look at Shahrastani, but, but note that the Ghazali is writing this first thing in 1095. Um, Shahrastani is 1127, over 30 years later. Has any change taken place? What Shahrastani gives us in a very brief statement, unfortunately, way too brief, he says that Hassan wrote a book. In it, there are four chapters that lay out the, the propositions of the argument. And then there are other chapters. I don't know why anybody decided the book was called Four Chapters. There's no basis for that. That Sorry, isn't what Professor, Shahrastani says. Professor Walter, um, we have uh, yes. about a few minutes. If you maybe you can- Okay, go very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So um, in, in any case, that's, that's Shahrastani and there's a big difference. So has something happened between here? So two final things. One is what effect does this um, argument the Tadim argument, which really invalidates the function of, of human reasoning and proves that it's inadequate to achieve the sufficient clarity and, and certainty. What effect did that have on him? And did it have anything to do with his crisis, his mental crisis? The second one, just briefly, is that the Fatimid Caliph al Mustansir dies, and thereby setting off this horrendous uh, dispute between two sons, which lives with us to this day. So on the one hand, <clears throat> we have the Caliph al-Mustali in Cairo and uh, al-Mustafa al in Alexandria for nearly a full year. And then um, uh, Nizar, uh, the one in Alexandria is captured and his ultimate fate <clears throat> is unclear. So what happened in Alamut? Did they recognize what I'd like to know is, do we have any direct evidence of, of Hassan actually saying anything? We know that, that he um, accepted Nazar as the Imam. Then the other question is, did he um, admit the death of Nazar? Well, anyway, that's maybe lead us astray here. But I would like to be able to tell you what Ghazali found out during that year. Um, well, in the first book from that year, he doesn't give any indication. But over 10 years later, he's still writing about the Ismailis. And by then, it's very clear, and he says it twice in two different books, the authority among the Ismailis, that is the Talimis, is the master of Alamut, Hassan, who has now become the agent for an absent imam. The imam is Ghaib. Now, what happens in that case to the Talim argument, which presumed that the Imam was um, available? Well, the final point here, the end of Ghazali's involvement is that he finally says, yes, we accept that there must be a uh, teacher, an instructor, and that teacher must be infallible, but that was Muhammad. His Ismaili opponent will then say, but he's dead. And Ghazali will say, but your Imam is absent. Anyway, there's more to the story, but that's where Ghazali comes to the end.